morning. Um, it's a little after seven, so we'll get started. Uh, my name's Luke Couch, and this morning I'll be talking about male breast cancer. I'd like to thank Dr. Burns for allowing me to present his patient. Um, just briefly, I have no disclosures, uh, and this is kind of our outline. We'll present a case, talk about male breast cancer, uh, briefly discuss gynecomastia, and then the cost of medicine. Uh, so our case report, um, this was a 60-year-old male uh, with a new left breast mass. Uh, interestingly, he had a history of gynecomastia, and in his college years, he had um, an operation with plastic surgery in 1978 for this. Uh, he was left postoperatively with some left nipple retraction, um, but his wife and the patient felt that uh, maybe around uh, six months to a year prior to his diagnosis, it had increased and they had noticed some crusting about the nipple and he had had uh, endorsed an episode of drainage. Uh, he was referred uh, to Dr. Burns by his primary care physician for further evaluation. His past medical history was significant for gynecomastia as mentioned. Uh, hypertension and low testosterone. Uh, his only surgical history that was notable was his uh, bilateral mastectomy um, and a spinal surgery, and he only took lisinopril uh, for his hypertension. And he did not have any family history of breast cancer. So on his physical exam, um, his breast was notable, notable for um, asymmetry with scarring from his prior surgeries. Uh, his left nipple was retracted versus the right with a crusty material on the surface. Uh, no masses were palpated on the right. And on his left breast, you could palpate a two and a half centimeter mass deep to the areola. Uh, and I have a picture of his breast here. Um, you can't really appreciate the retraction or the crusting in this picture. This was when after he'd been prepped uh, on the OR table, but I think we can see some of that in some of the subsequent pictures. So he was worked up. Dr. Burns performed um, an ultrasound guided core needle biopsy uh, in the office. Uh, it returned as invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, it was ER positive, weakly progesterone uh, receptor positive, and HER2 negative. Uh, he underwent genetic, genetic testing, which was all negative, and then he was consented for surgery. Uh, so he underwent a mastectomy, and here is uh, with sentinel load biopsy. Uh, and I think uh, you can really appreciate the retraction in this picture specifically uh, with the head towards the upper right corner of the picture. Um, we... Uh, had to take a portion of the pectoralis uh, muscle to get adequate margins. Um, there's a picture of the specimen. And then um, he required uh, some pretty uh, large uh, superior and inferior flaps to be mobilized to get adequate closure, but he ended up closing quite nicely. So his pathology returned um, as an invasive ductal car carcinoma. Uh, he was stay as he was no his nodes were negative, uh, and he was staged as a 1A uh, overall. So male, male breast cancer, um, it's rare. Uh, it represents less than less than one percent of all breast malignancies. Around 2,600 men were diagnosed in the U.S. in 2016. Uh, with 440 cancer deaths. And worldwide, the incidence uh, is 122 female cases to one male case. It tends to occur later in life, uh, 72 versus 61. It's diagnosed at a more advanced stage, and it's more often ER positive. Um, overall, uh, most of these cancers are ER positive, as I mentioned, and, but African American men are more likely to be triple negative and present at a more advanced stage and, and they have the worst survival overall. Uh, so risk factors, uh, endocrine, uh, gynecomastia can be, 
uh, testicular conditions, liver disease, diabetes, uh, nutritional uh, and lifestyle factors, and then uh, genetic factors can certainly be risk factors. Uh, notably, Klinefelter syndrome is the strongest risk factor for developing male breast cancer, and this syndrome is just uh, having atrophic testes, gynecomastia, high serum levels of uh, gonadotropins, and the patients are often receiving exogenous androgens uh, for their condition. And they have a, a 19 and 58 fold increase in incidence and mortality. Uh, gynecomastia, as in our case, is related in cases of estrogen excess. Uh, this condition is most often drug related, uh, but how it, many of the drugs associated with gynecomastia are also associated with male breast cancer. And then genetic family history is implicated in 15 uh, to 20 percent of cases. Uh, it's higher in BRCA2 carriers than uh, B versus BRCA1 carriers, uh, but any male with uh, male breast cancer should be offered genetic testing, and if positive, uh, their family should undergo testing as well. Uh, these patients most often present with a painless subareolar lump. It's uh, slightly more common on the left. Uh, and nipple involvement occurs early in almost half of cases with retraction, discharge, and ulceration uh, in a few as well. Uh, the differential diagnosis is short. Uh, gynecomastia is the main one. Um, but to differentiate the two, gynecomastia is often bilateral. It's symmetric uh, with the absence of adenopathy, and it's mobile. Uh, it could be a, uh, another consideration would be a lipoma or an abscess or a sarcoma. Uh, imaging uh, is needed in all these cases. Mammography uh, demonstrates an abnormality in 89% of cases. Uh, the masses, uh, identified masses are dense uh, without calcifications and are often speculated. Uh, ultrasound might demonstrate an irregularly shaped hypoechoic mass. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, any suspicious lesions or any lesions in a man uh, that would otherwise be classified as benign in women need to undergo biopsy just because they're so rare uh, and are often implicated in cancer. Um, when, as with most things, you have to have a tissue diagnosis. And in men, it's invasive ductive carcinoma in the majority of cases. Uh, as mentioned again, most of them are ER positive, And there's a higher incidence of Paget's disease uh, versus females. Um, much lower incidence of HER2 positive disease. So the man management uh, surgical or surgery is one of the mainstays. And um, mastectomy is the gold standard. Uh, the lack of surrounding breast tissue and the central location of these tumors uh, can preclude breast conserving therapy. There's often skin involvement uh, or the tumor invades the underlying uh, muscle. Um, this article uh, was kind of is a retrospective re review applying uh, the Z11 trial results to men, uh, just 41 patients. Uh, 19 patients had recurrent or metastatic disease, but they did conclude that less radical surgical techniques uh, used to treat women were generalizable to men, and breast conserving therapy uh, with sentinel node biopsy, uh, plus or minus adjuvant therapy, could uh, be considered in men with less advanced disease. So what about nodal management? Uh, the management's primarily based on experience in women, but uh, as in women, it's a strong predictor of local recurrence and metastasis. Uh, it's present in around 50% of cases, and surgical assessment is definitely a component of treatment. Uh, this paper is out of Mil Milan. Uh, it was a study from 1996 to 2010 with almost 19,000 sentinel node biopsies. Uh, but only 32 for male breast cancer. Uh, but they identified the node in all patients, uh, six with disease, and they had no overt recurrence at 30 months uh, with the biopsy. 
this paper was out of uh, Sloan Kettering. Uh, from, it studied patients from 1996 to 2005. 78 patients were included. Um, the signal node was identified in 76 uh, patients. Three were clinically positive. Uh, all patients went on to have an axillary node dissection. At 28 months of follow-up, they had had no axillary recurrences. And the concluded men uh, were more likely to have positive nodes versus their female counterparts. And then what to do about locally advanced disease. Uh, T3, stage 3, and inflammatory breast cancers should receive or at least be considered for neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, in women, it's been demonstrated that uh, they have high rates of clinical response, improved cosmesis, and no difference in survival uh, with the addition of neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And then what about radiation therapy? Uh, men are more likely to be offered uh, adjuvant radiation therapy out of concern for adequate margins and uh, the aforementioned chest wall and skin involvement that these patients often have uh, even, with smaller, even with smaller tumors. And this paper uh, was, a 19, uh, was from 1997 to 2006, it was a re retrospective review of 81 men and concluded that there was no difference in overall survival uh, with adjuvant radiation, but that it did decrease local recurrence. And uh, moving on to adjuvant systemic therapy, um, this can either be endocrine-based uh, chemotherapy or biological therapy uh, following surgical resection. Uh, due to the high ER percentage in most of these can uh, cancers, uh, five years of tamoxin is generally the first line treatment offered. Uh, these patients should undergo an oncotype DX, which is a proprietary genetic test uh, of the tumor, which has been validated in women with node negative early stage hormone receptor positive tumors to predict uh, the benefit of chemotherapy. Uh, and it's also found to be applicable in men. And, um, Chemotherapy recommendations uh, for these women, uh, if you can find, a, uh, they're often um, applicable to men with comparable disease. There haven't been any large studies of uh, Herceptin use in men for HER2 positive disease, but it should definitely be considered. Uh, more on the oncotype uh, testing, it's become uh, almost a standard of care and it generates a 0 to 100 score with high scores uh, benefiting from adjuvant chemotherapy and low scores predicting a lower risk of recurrence without chemotherapy. Uh, the Taylor X trial recently concluded and was published in the middle of last year and it sought to determine the benefit of endocrine therapy alone versus chemotherapy uh, plus endocrine therapy for patients with a middle of the road score. Um, so they had uh, patients with scores uh, from 11 to 25, almost 7,000 of them, who were randomized. Uh, they had her, a, uh, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, node negative disease, and they were randomized to either receive the endocrine therapy alone uh, or chemotherapy plus endocrine therapy. And for these lower middle of the road scores, um, comparable invasive disease-free survival was observed with a comparable overall survival uh, at nine years follow-up. And we, I'll talk about that in just a moment. So a brief word on gynecomastia. It's just benign enlargement of the glandular component of the male breast. And it's due to an um, estrogen-androgen imbalance um, for whatever reason. It can be uni, uni or bilateral. Uh, it can cause pain, uh, but it can be painless, and it's most often subareolar. There's a trimodal incidence. It can occur in the neonatal period, uh, puber pubertal period, and in the sixth and through eighth decades. On exam, it often presents as a firm, mobile donut uh, of subareolar tissue, and the hallmark is concentricity. 
uh, and just a note, gynecomastia does not equal lipomastia, which is just a fatty breast. And there are a number of drugs that can cause it. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of common hypertensive agents, um, cancer drugs, cardiovascular drugs, um, et cetera. So our patient, uh, he had uh, his mastectomy and healed well from that. Uh, he was referred to medical and radiation oncology. Uh, he underwent a DEXA scan, which demonstrated osteopenia, which uh, made him a little bit of a contraindication to So he's elected to be started on a nastrozole uh, therapy, which is an aromatase inhibitor. Um, he was offered chest wall radiation uh, with a boost to the supraclavicular nodal basin. Uh, I think he was trying to decide on that based on the note from uh, the radiation oncologist. And um, he's not going to undergo uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. His oncotype uh, DX score was 27, uh, which was just a bit higher. Uh, Taylor X study, and his oncologist had a conversation with him about that, and because of his lower risk, um, for uh, undergo endocrine therapy. Uh, here are my, the cost of medicine. Uh, a 30 day supply of 20 milligrams of tamoxifen, tamoxifen is $20, and uh, out over five years, the cost would be around $1,200. Uh, the price has since come down since it's become generic. And here are my references. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions, comments. What about the? Uh, what about the? Inc did you did you notice the incidence of BRCA positive patients with confirmed breast cancer? Uh, yes, sir. Men. I, I believe uh, for the BRCA BRCA two patients, uh, it increased their risk of around fifty percent a lifetime. What I mean is, if they if they have confirmed cancer, what's their chance of being BRCA positive? Oh, up 15 to 20 percent, okay. sir. Right. That, that was, uh, <clears throat> I, think, <clears throat> I think you reversed something on that last slide. Tamoxifen actually improves bone density, does not decrease bone density. It improves bone density. Um, the aromatase inhibitors can cause bone loss, um, especially the first two years of use. So I don't know why he, if he has bone loss, I don't know why he got put on instead of tamoxifen, there would be other risk factors for DVT and other things they may have decided to do that, but tamoxifen actually helps bone density. I haven't seen him back since then, so I don't know. Um, it, is it, I noticed in the, in the study from Sloan Kettering that they had gone ahead and done axillary node dissections. Yes, sir. That study ended in 2005. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case now. Is that uh, recent data about that? Uh, no, of course, sir. I don't think you handle that any different than you do in a woman. I, I, the treatment is based primarily on experience with women and with axillary dissect, dissections becoming less you common. Aware of it? Laura, I mean, I don't, yeah, that's what I thought. It's extrapolated. It doesn't yeah, yeah. This is the first patient I've had that had had surgery for gynecomastia and then still ended up with breast cancers. But that was the most unusual thing about this case. And, and I really was not aware until you, you said there is a, that gynecomastia does increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Only if the cause is because of a primary estrogen excess is what I read. Okay. Uh, well, I think the other the other comment to make would be about uh, about gynecomastia. Uh, that is something that, I mean, I see fifteen or twenty cases of gynecomastia to one of breast cancer in males, and it's something that particularly in the adolescent age group can really be a difficult problem. I mean, Kurt, you all may see it some in, on the pediatric. I mean, that's, it's usually in that population, and I've had some. Really pitiful cases. It's a fine line between gynecomastia and the lipomastia. Um, but I've had, and I remember one kid that would wear six t shirts to keep 
his, his breast from showing, uh, you know, because he'd been made fun of so much by his colleagues. Uh, and so sometimes you end up to, have to end up actually considering uh, surgery just uh, psychological benefits that ended up that end up occurring. Uh, the other thing is that I've ended up operating on people for is the pain, uh, the tenderness. Uh, grandfathers that can't hold their grandchildren because when they get them to the chest wall, it hurts. They bump their breast and it hurts. I see, yeah, I see it, it, it nodding your head because I've sure had that several times. And a lot of times those patients are on either antihypertensive or, cardi or, or drugs for heart disease and you can't change them. I mean, they, they need good substitutes, or at least that's what their cardiologists have said, and so you end up, you know, it's, it's an outpatient procedure, and for most people in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, they don't really care that much about uh, about the cosmetic issues. This particular one, this gentleman's wife was more concerned about what he was going to look like cosmetically than she was whether or not he was going to live from his cancer, which was really kind of an unusual situation, but uh, anyway, yellow. Yeah, <clears throat> so in adolescence, the most common scenario is 14-year-old boys during puberty when you get the mixed estrogen androgen effects. And um, for the most part, those resolve. The ones you need to be aware of are the, are the men that get into adolescence where it doesn't resolve. If, if it goes on and on, it is not going to resolve, and they do need to be addressed surgically. I've seen several men in their 20s who have pretty significant breast development where people have just told them if they lose weight and work out, it'll go away. And they're, um, I mean, very dispirited. I had one guy that wanted to join the military who hadn't joined the military because of this. So you, if, if they get into adolescence, they need surgery either by you or plastic surgery. And then the other group that you didn't mention for gynecomastia that is the huge bubble of patients that we have started to see um, is, is smoking weed, is marijuana use. Because, so there's really, that's the bump is men, if you see men in their 20s with gynecomastia, that's the very first question, because that's usually the cause. You'll see it, if we, you'll see it in patients who are taking Marinol as well, but uh, the people are laughing about the, about the huge wave of gynecomastia that we're going to see as uh, legalization of marijuana takes place um, in different, par different parts of the country. So for those men, they need to stop smoking weed. They, there's not a surgical issue. They just need to quit using. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's usually the first question I ask, but I usually ask the parents to step out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty common that that's part of the problem. The, 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 the biggest problem we have, and, and I've kind of shunted most of my stuff to because she likes to do this, but uh, is insurance payment. They will not pay for this. So regardless of the six T-shirts, not wanting to take their shirt off, regardless of that, they, they, and regardless of the documentation, they just refuse to pay for it because it's a cosmetic. These kids do have a lot of psychosocial issues because of that. You would think it's a joke, but it's really, really kind of happens a lot. So. I'm glad you mentioned that. I've not <clears throat> really checked. I believe in uh, older males, I think they have paid for it. If you document that the reason you're doing it is the pain. Uh, but I don't know that. I don't follow. I don't follow collection well enough to know. I know those adolescent, uh, the adolescent kids that I've done. I don't think I've been paid for any of them. But I've done several of them just because I felt so sorry for the kids uh, over time. Um, do you know if Medicare pays for it, Laura? I'm sorry. Do you know if Medicare pays for the what I, I in, a, it, in I adult do, males? I do Oh, I do so too. Oh, yeah. I, the procedure I do is an excisional breast biopsy. Yeah, okay. That's what I, yeah. that's how I break it. Yeah, them. yeah. Now that it's harder in the teenage boys because a lot of times they, they may need nipple repositioning if they've got, yeah. and so they, they need more extensive um, surgery done, but that's how I. I think one other brief point that the tech, uh, when, you, when I've done these, um, Several times <coughs> I fashioned uh, the, I use very few drains and uh, anyway, but uh, in this circumstance, if you take a uh, scalp vein set <coughs> and cut holes in the tubing, 
and leave the needle out and put it in for your for your for your drain for the mastec for the gynecomasticasis. Then they give them a, give them a box full of chest of test tubes that you draw blood with. They can stick it on that needle and keep it decompressed. And so that's a technique I've used because the the cat of the drains that we've had at least in the past are too big for the this relatively small size of the operative technique. Mike, are you going to make a point? I'm sorry. It was my experience uh, the insurance companies won't pay for the surgery in an adolescent until they've had symptomatic gynecomastia for two to three years. Okay. Uh, they have, you have to document the pain and you have to document uh, that non steroidals are of no help. Okay, well, good good discussion. It, it's something. It, it, it's something that uh, all of you that practice general surgery, uh, particularly you know if you go to general surgery, is going to see a lot of breast cases. You're going to see some of these cases. And Laura's point about continuing to follow those patients past adolescence is really important. Uh, you know, I usually follow them for a couple of years, and if they don't go away, then you got to do something about it. Christy. I'm Alex Christie. I'm one of the interns, uh, also known as McCurry to some. So we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank Dr. Coons for letting me participate with this case, uh, and thanks to Richie Tanner for kind of helping me out with it too and being on PEDS with me. No disclosures. So here's just a little bit of the outline. A little bit of the outline we're going to talk about and kind of approach to mediastinal mass diagnosis and treatment and cost of medicine. So to get started, um, there's a two-month-old female that presented to the ED, five-day history of persistent fevers, decreased PO intake, irritability, and worsening respiratory distress with cough, nasal grunting, and this chest x-ray was taken. As you can see in the right lung field, a uh, large mass here, even in counting for the thymic silhouette in the pediatric population. Here's a lateral view showing pretty the significant mass in the anterior portion of the chest. So she did already have a past medical history at this two months. So she had a prenatal diagnosis on ultrasound MRI of a possible right middle lobe cystic lung lesion. Uh, suspicious for a CPAM at the time. Um, but she was delivered via C-section with no complications. She had a chest x birth um, that we'll get to, but didn't show any evidence of this CPAM that they thought she might have. Uh, but she was still referred to pediatric surgery um, at one month of age. She also had another chest x-ray um, that appeared to show an enlarged thymic silhouette, but no significant findings. So she was recommended to follow up in one year with a chest CT. So a little bit of a comparison. Um, this chest x-ray here um, was uh, postnatal at birth. Um, not super impressive. It kind of looked with that the thymic silhouette. Um, and a newborn um, baby can just be fairly prominent. And so here's the chest x-ray at one month of age when she followed up with Dr. Kuntz. Um, still prominent, but no real thing. And this is when she presented um, one, two months, so one month after a clinic visit. You can see kind of comparing the two, there's been a rapid enlargement of this right lung field mass. And so workup in the ED um, was significant for a fever 101 at home. Um, her vitals for her age were within normal limits. Um, she was irritable, um, apparently had some nasal grunting um, and tachypnic um, and accessory muscle use. Um, Lab-wise, it was relatively normal. Her white count, I think, was only about nine, but she did have bands present. Um, they did a kind of full workup looking to see why she was febrile um, that all essentially turned out to be except for an incidental UA showing uh, greater than 100,000 um, colony forming units of uh, proteus. And so this CT was taken after consulting with us in pulmonology. Let's see if this will go. All right, I made it back up. I figured that might happen. So here's her scalp film, and I'll kind of go through her CT that was taken. So as you can see, you already start to develop this right mediastinal lung mass, soft tissue density. 
And then if you look down here, there's a calcified region of this mass that is odd, as well as uh, this more attenuation to fat up here in the anterior portion. So here's the coronal view showing the large mass. If you go posterior, you see this large calcified region in the mass. So uh, she was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit um, with plans to take her the next day to the operating room for excision of this mass. Um, and so she did okay uh, preoperatively. She was on Vapotherm, managed to sat well, didn't decompensate. So she was taken to the operating room um, with precautions, with anesthesia, with intubating, as she did have a little bit of mass effect on the trachea. Uh, but she was intubated uneventfully. Um, and then a median sternotomy was used to enter the thorax using electrocautery and sharp dissection with scissors. Uh, mass was pretty much immediately identified, it appeared to have solid and cystic elements, and it was fairly adhered to the chest wall, pericardium, and diaphragm in the right lung field. Um, it was dissected free. Uh, during dissection, there was spillage of this kind of murky fluid into the pleural cavity odd um, and this was sent for culture um, and the mass uh, at excision measured 10 by 7 centimeters in size um, and patient tolerated it fairly well had two bilateral uh, 12 French chest tubes placed uh, the sternotomy was closed with zero ethobond in a figure of eight fashion um, the patient had no immediate intra-op complications and here is a picture of the mass you can see kind of the solid area here and cystic area here so kind of going through the workup of a mediastinal mass, um, a lot of times it will just be an incidental finding on imaging or it will be found after nonspecific non upper and lower respiratory symptoms that include any of these cough, shortness of breath, and going down below some of the more rare patients that you would find this on. And the main mainstay of workup is laboratory markers, but mostly imaging. So here are some laboratory studies. Um, that you can get to look at um, the different etiologies of these masses, uh, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, um, specifically for thymic tumors, for thymoma and myasthenia gravis, whereas AFP and beta-HCG are used to look at germ cell tumors. Um, specifically, it'll kind of let you know what type of germ cell tumors are involved in this mediastinal mass. Uh, LDH is sometimes also used, but it's fairly nonspecific because it will also be elevated in germ cell tumors, but also in lymphoma, another common cause of a mediastinal mass. And so the mainstay is imaging. Um, the mainstay of the imaging is a chest CT is usually used. And a lot of times after the CT, it will have specific features um, that can guide the next step, um, such as in our case where there was no real further workup and went straight to the operating room for some of the features we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, just going over a little bit of the mediastinal anatomy, um, you can see that it's divided into three main areas between the anterior, middle, and posterior areas. Um, these are not, you know, technically any specific anatomic planes that divide these. These are relative looking at the structures that comprise each section of it. Um, and any tumor that invades through the pleura is not considered a mediastinal tumor, but um, has invaded into it. So the anterior compartment, the main um, organ that sits there is the thymus uh, in addition to lymph nodes. The middle mediastinum contains the heart, um, ascending aorta, um, trachea, bronchi, and some of these nerves, whereas the posterior contain the elements between the spinal column and the great vessels. This includes esophagus, descending aorta, um, some other vascular lymph nodes. So going through some more of the imaging studies, um, in addition to chest CT, there are some other imaging modalities you can use. Um, you know, we don't use MR as much, but it can be useful. If you look here, this was a mass that was found left upper lung field. A chest CT was obtained that showed it in the posterior region of the lungs. Um, you can see the acne here in this kind of area involving the um, spinal canal that was suspicious. You can see the actual contrast on the MR down here compared to the CT is quite a bit better because it shows actual invasion from the spinal canal into this area, um, and this was a schwannoma. 
Um, another study that you can use is PET CT, um, especially good for looking what uh, tumors are metabolically very active, um, and it can be used to identify the preferred biopsy site. Um, PET CT can still be misleading uh, because there are non malignant conditions that will light up and be hypermetabolic, is how this is obtained if they take up fluorodeoxyglucose avidly. Um, it can kind of muddy the water. Um, here's an example, though, of its usefulness showing it's very suspicious for a lymphoma with how FDG avid it is. Um, and so this is kind of what we were talking about with the MR um, that is pretty good for looking, especially for posterior things. Um, if they're going to need a neurosurgical, we'll generally insist on the MR um, to show you pretty good soft tissue um, windows. Um, uh, occasionally, a technetium or um, 131 scan will be used um, if you're starting to suspect more of endocrine um, etiologies. And especially in young males, when they have a mediastinal mass, um, you'll generally biopsy this first. But most males with germ cell tumors that have a mediastinal mass will also get a scrotal ultrasound, given the high incidence of um, concomitant uh, scrotal conditions. So after imaging, um, most cases will generally require a tissue sample for a biopsy, um, especially if it is suspicious for lymphoma. Biopsy is important for genetic studies um, and for confirmation. The different uh, biopsy methods is the most commonly used is percutaneous uh, under CT guidance for most masses. Um, if it's near the airways, EBUS um, is used more and more often. Um, it's fairly specific if the mass is actually uh, accessible via the tracheobronchial tree. Um, ultrasound is pretty good. And then if either of these two methods are unable to access the lesion or you need a large amount of tissue, uh, especially in lymphoma, um, if the oncologist needs a large amount, then they may need a surgical biopsy. And there's a few different methods um, that you can access that. Described as this anterior metastinotomy or the Chamberlain procedure, um, where an incision is made in the second intercostal space, um, and sometimes the rib has to be um, detached from the sternum. Uh, but occasionally, especially in the pediatric population, you can get by with just a rib spreader. Um, but generally, for anterior lesions in the anterior metastinum, this is pretty good for adding accessing it because you don't have to enter the pleural space. Um, no need for a chest tube. Um, it can be done on an outpatient basis, which is pretty nice. Um, cervical mediastinoscopy um, can be used for the middle mediastinum as you have an inferior view and can be essentially looking down on the gorilles um, is also an option. Um, both of these methods I, were reading, I was reading was not as commonly used as they used to be now with endobrachial ultrasound kind of gaining favorability as well as percutaneous biopsies. And then the last is if it's unable to be reached with either of these methods, then a VATS can be used. It's going to give you great visualization, going to allow you to biopsy pretty much anywhere in the mediastinum. Um, and it can be performed on an outpatient basis, but most people are going to um, put in a chest tube postoperatively and at least have an open mission. So going through some of the differential of a mediastinal mass, um, a lot of it depends on the location and patient's age. We all are taught the four T's mnemonic um, in med school for the anterior compartment, the most common causes. Um, and so for the anterior, the most common lesions are a thymoma, teratoma, thyroid, and terrible lymphoma. Um, there are some other things that can occur here, but those are by far the most common, and it's kind of age-dependent what you're going to in adults, a thymoma is going to be the most common. Um, Hedrick actually gave us a lecture a few weeks ago. He was talking about an anterior mass in an adult without B symptoms um, as a thymoma until proven otherwise, whereas in children, lymphoma um, is going to be the most common cause of a mediastinal mass. Um, uh, middle compartment mass is less common. Um, the most common cause of that is generally lymphadenopathy um, from another cancer versus a enteric cyst, such as a esophageal duplication cyst or a pericardial cyst. Um, and then the posterior compartment is um, mostly originating from the spinal canal, like the schwannoma we looked at earlier and the other um, neurogenic uh, masses. So here's just kind of a table talking about common things. You can see it's a fairly broad differential. 
um, in the anterior compartment showing the thymus, lymphoma, uh, teratoma, and thyroid. And you can have these less common ones also. And so the surgical approach uh, for a mediastinal mass, um, for anterior masses that cross the midline or generally require a sternotomy for adequate. Um, it will not allow exposure if it extends below the pulmonary hilum, and if this is the case, um, then you may need uh, to extend the incision. If the mass is only on one side of the chest, hemiclamshell um, can be used to provide adequate visualization, but if it extends below the pulmonary hyal on both sides, you'll need a full clamshell excision. Um, a thoracotomy incision is the most common approach for middle and posterior mediastinal mass. Um, and there is has been VATS described, but it, it's uh, still not as common for these masses. So getting back to the patient, um, this was uh, the chest x-ray and um, post-operatively as the patient went to the pediatric intensive care unit. As you can see here, she was taken back into bed um, with the ET tube in place and bilateral chest tubes uh, placed to wall suction. And you can see that the uh, mediastinal mass um, has been removed. She's got fairly good aeration of the right lung field. So she was taken to the PICU, chest tubes placed to wall suction. Um, she did very well. She was able to be extubated on post-op day one. Um, and the pathology came back is consistent with a uh, benign mature teratoma with some calcific consistency like bone um, as well as some benign thymic tissue that was taken. Her beta HCG was negative and AFP was mildly elevated, um, not anywhere in the range of a um, germ cell tumor. Um, and she did have the micro from the chest, uh, the pleural cavity pending um, as we talked about. And so that microbio uh, came back, actually came back as an abundant growth of salmonella. Um, an infectious disease was asked to see the patient, and they felt that it was unlikely to be a contaminant, and they suspected that she had somehow acquired salmonella, uh, and this had seeded the teratoma. As they kind of dug into the history, there was apparently cousins that raised chickens and had a chicken coop, and the um, parents often took um, their baby to visit them pretty often, so it was the suspected source. Um, so ID recommended Rocephin for 10 days. And so kind of going over germ cell tumors, uh, they're classified as extragonal. There's no evidence of a primary tumor in the testes as ovaries, the most common location. Um, they generally all occur in the midline location, but can occur anywhere along this midline. Um, in adults, the most common area is the anterior metastinum, followed by these. Um, in infant children, metastinum is actually not the most common. It's generally sacrococcygeal tumors and intracranial germ cell tumors. Um, there's a lot of kind of nomenclature that's kind of confusing for this. Um, in males, they're either classified as seminomas or non-seminomatous non germ cell tumors. And in women, they just call them dysgerminomas and non-dysgerminomas. Um, it is confusing. Um, but it is important to distinguish the two types of germ cell tumors because of the differences in prognosis and treatment. For a tumor to be considered a seminoma or dysgerminoma, it has to contain one hist histology and not other elements. Um, and so the non-seminomatous um, tumors are yolk sac, choreo, teratomas like in our case, and any veins, multiple cell lines, or mixed tumors. Um, for mature teratomas, they generally behave in a benign manner. Um, uh, if they have any elements of uh, rapid growth they actually then have a fairly poor prognosis um, but in children immature elements can be normal um, given how young they are um, and so teratomas themselves are benign plasms uh, that contain elements from more than one of the three embryonic germ cell layers uh, endoderm mesoderm and ectoderm um, and the classification is that they have tissue that is foreign to the anatomic site in which they are found this can be, for you know, in our case, a mediastinal that has intestinal gland cells or calcified structures such as bone and teeth, fingernails, um, and they can occur any in the midline in children. Like I said, sacrococcygeal is actually the most common location. Um, and here's kind of talking about between if they're classified as mature or immature. Um, immature can be potentially malignant in children, but the incidence of malignant transformation is still pretty low. Um, 
uh, teratomas are most common in females. You can see in a four to one ratio here. Um, and the location is associated with age as well, as you can hear here. And so here's kind of interesting pathology showing what a actual dermatoma or teratoma pathology would look like. Um, just on this one slide, you can see multiple cell types um, between adipose tissue here, cartilage, intestinal cells, um, and, or sorry, this is the thyroid follicles and intestinal cells. So it's kind of crazy to have multiple different tunnels in one slide. And the treatment for teratomas is surgical resection. Um, resection is generally curative, especially when complete resection is possible. Um, if you're unable to obtain a complete resection, a subtotal resection is still indicated as uh, people will generally have a resolution in symptoms and not have a large recurrence even with subtotal resection. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence for adjuvant chemo or radiation um, because teratomas do not have a uh, high turnover rate like other cancers and are relatively sensitive to chemo radiation. This is different than other germ cell tumors like yolk sac and choreo um, that are malignant and will require um, neoadjuvant combination of usually these are the most common used between etobicide, ephosphamide, and cisplatin, pretty cytotoxic. And so getting into case reports of infected teratomas, um, there's only really individual case reports. I couldn't even find a case showing multiple patients that had um, had a teratoma get infected. Um, it just kind of has a few different ones I found here showing a young adult um, versus a child. Um, one of them I think was H-fluenza, um, and the other one were common upper respiratory um, bugs, but no actual case reports of a secondary infection with salmonella. And interestingly, a rapidly growing teratoma, as in our patient, you know, the had encased a lot of the right chest uh, after just one month are also fairly rare. Um, here's a few case reports. I couldn't find a case series, just a few case reports um, showing a rapidly growing teratoma. Um, this one down here was interesting that showed that even though it was a mature teratoma, it was still responsive to um, uh, hormones um, and uh, estrogen progesterone receptors that apparently cause the rapid growth. To medicine, um, our, uh, she stayed in the pediatric ICUs, we'll get to here in a second, um, for about one week. Um, and the cost of a two-week stay in an ICU billable to the patient is about $31,000. Um, and mechanically ventilated patients, significantly higher cost if you look down here, um, compared to non-mechanically -mechan ventilated is only 13,000 well, 13, compared to 32. And the most of the costs are actually within the first day just of getting someone all of the resources necessary to get them mechanically ventilated. So even though our patient was only mechanically ventilated for two days, the um, cost on the first day is generally $10,000 to the patient. And so our patient's outcome, uh, her post-operative course in the pediatric ICU was uneventful. She was able to get her right chest tube out on post-op day four, uh, left chest tube out on post-op day six. The next day she was discharged home in good condition. She followed up uh, with Dr. Kuntz and was doing well and looking at the medical record. She has not required any repeat hospitalizations that we know of. Um, she had a chest x-ray obtained three months post-op. The four picture here with the large mass anterior lateral and then a fairly normal chest x-ray can show complete expansion of that right lung, no more mediastinal mass in the lateral views. So there are my references. Okay. Uh <clears throat> Dr. Wispoon. I got a question for you, Alex. So, yeah. um, I got a question for your radiology sensibilities. If you go back and look at the chest x-ray after your birth, so can you see the calcifications? And if you'd seen calcifications, would that, I mean, would that have tipped you off at that point? I mean, can you pick them out now? It's kind of hard to see. In retrospect? I mean, I'm not asking you to yeah. go back and look. No. This, this is the one that she presented with in the ER. Um, in the office, it was subtle, if any, recognizable uh, calcification. So, obviously, I felt a little burnt, um, but 
Uh, you know, I looked at it compared to the previous. I didn't really appreciate a big change. Radiology confirmed what I said, and she had no respiratory trouble. So typically in a kid, the other thing is, is it didn't really show anything on the prenatal MRI, which was should have shown something you would have thought. So a little bit of uh, misleading uh, imaging, um, but uh, a kid with a cystic lung mass kind of resolving is not, uh, is not uncommon, which is why we get the postnatal chest x-ray, and if it doesn't show anything, I still get a chest CT down the road for the CPAN. So, uh, you know, the thing that was crazy about this kid is she presented with this acute respiratory distress because I think it got acutely infected, enlarged markedly. Um, so uh, definitely, definitely interesting. I couldn't find the, I mean, even if you can see it, I mean, I think in retrospect, you might could say that inferior margin might be calcified down there, but it's overlying the ribs, so it's, it was kind of tough. So. Well, I assume we're going to publish this case, though, with this secondary infection. I mean, this yeah, Yes, sir. Doc, Dr. Tanner did a great job yeah. presenting it at uh, Southeastern, and he's already written the manuscript. Okay. So, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. What about uh, the, t the technique there where you're talking about the mediastinotomy or mediastinoscopy. Uh, I've never seen one uh, with that initial picture we showed there, Alex. Is, is that, it, any of you all speak to that issue? The first pic, the first cartoon you had of medias, mediastinoscopy. You know, um, Dr. That, Head you know used that one there. Uh, it, does anybody use that? I Chamberlain procedure so I, I have done that in the past okay. and, and actually I wanted to bring up really kind of a general point um, especially for us uh, with an anterior medial spinal mass um, you put these kids to sleep and they can crash on you pretty quick right? so uh, the anterior mediastinotomy was really designed to do under local anesthesia with the patient sitting kind of upright so that you don't put them at risk of having respiratory collapse because of losing all that intrinsic muscle um, when they go to, to support the, the mediastinum. Uh, and you probably remember, I was in the operating room when this baby was going to sleep because uh, the other thing you can do is flip them on their uh, chest and put them prone and get the weight off of them and hopefully get them through it. Sometimes you even have to put them on ECMO. So, uh, but this, this is a relatively easy procedure to do. I remember doing it with Dr. Ricketts down in Atlanta a couple times, and you think, well, it's going to take forever to find the mass. You basically cut down, you cut through the but intercostal you muscle, the, and you're you right on top of it. Go through the second intercostal space over there, just to the yes, side, sir. just to the side of the sternum. Yes, sir. And it doesn't have to be on the left. It's really whatever your imaging suggests. Um, like on this kid, I would have done it on the right because that's where the majority of the tumor was. Um, um, but uh, and that's just to get tissue biopsy, and typically yeah, that, it's it's yeah. a it's a lymphoma what you're biopsying just to get the, uh, and then you can go in with the uh, median, median stenoscopy where you basically make a uh, super uh, sternotomy incision and look with the camera. I remember doing that several times with Dr. Head um, as a resident. But this is this is what I more commonly yes, sir. Uh, was exposed to here, and that's why I was curious about the, the two different techniques. I guess one other technical thing, what do you close the sternum with? in a median sternotomy in a baby like this? Just, just permanent ethylbond suture. Yeah, we didn't use, I mean, you, you, you could use uh, wire, but that's pretty aggressive and you don't really need to. Babies are pretty malleable. One quick question, Kuntz. You said the pre-op MRI missed the mass or the inter retrospectively? Yeah, Can yes. you see it or yes. was just the reading? Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, misinterpreted, I think. So. so the imaging showed it was just misinterpreted. Uh, I, I think it was difficult to tell what what was there. Right, so, I can, yeah. I can yeah. understand that, yeah, okay. Well, two great cases, very well presented. Thank you very much, both of you. Good job.